Well, all we're looking at is the parametric equations of the conic sections, all four of them. Okay. Now, we already know most of these, uh, and so it won't take too much effort to develop what they are. But what I want to demonstrate is how these relate and how you use them very briefly. Okay. So, to begin, what are the four conics in order, again? Okay, we start with the circle. Okay. What do we do next? The ellipse. the ellipse is what happens when you stretch that circle out. The parabola. Oh, yeah. right? And that's what happens when it gets stretched so far, it, it breaks open. And then the hyperbola is what happens when on the cone, which is actually a double cone, where you go sufficiently far enough that you don't just get one branch, one intersection, one section of the cone, you actually wind up hitting the other side. And that's why there are these two branches. Okay? So, let's think about the Cartesian equations for all these, because we know all of these, and we'll just do some standard forms, okay? So, for instance here, we have x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Now, we would usually say r squared, right? r squared, because it's the radius, okay? Now, we know the parametric equations for this circle. Parametric equations are equations for x and y that connect us back to that single variable, whatever that may be. Okay. Now, what variable do we choose as a parameter for the circle? We chose an angle measured at the center, at the origin, from the point against the positive x-axis. Very important we define what that is. Okay. So then we said, okay, well, if um, I've got a radius of r, this is not the unit circle, right? Well, I mean, it might be, but we don't know. So therefore, instead of just cos theta, sine theta, I have to account for the fact that I'm r times further away from the origin. So that's where we get this from. Okay, like so. Uh, also important to mention, there's kind of a range restriction on theta, right? Um, it, it can't just go anywhere, because once you go like, around a full revolution, you've come back to where you started, right? So therefore, I guess the way we'd say this is, um, as extension two students, thinking in gradients rather than in degrees, I can go from naught to two pi. That's one full revolution. I mean, in theory, there's nothing stopping you going past two pi, but the whole point is to have one unique defining factor for where you are on your on your locus, right? So therefore, if I restrict it from 0 to 2 pi, everything is unique, uniquely defined. Okay, so when we go to the ellipse, what changes? Okay, We still have the x squared plus y squared, but we don't frame it in these terms, do we? Uh, we tend to say, well, there's a 1 over here, and then we get some denominators. And we have different denominators, generally speaking, because if you don't have different denominators, you're back up in circle territory. Yes? So we've got our a squared and our b squared here. Now here's one of the beauties of um, parametric forms, right? Because what this does is this takes the unit circle, right? x squared plus y squared equals 1. And it stretches the horizontal out a times bigger. And it stretches the vertical out b times bigger, right? So instead of being a cos theta sine theta, there's no r to speak of because it doesn't have a radius, right? You're going to be at x equals, you'll be a times further away from the origin, so you get a cos theta. And you'll be uh, b times further than the origin, speaking vertical, so you'll be at b sine theta, right? And we have the same restriction coming in. <coughs> Zero, theta, <coughs> two pi, okay? So you can see, I can, just like I can on the circle, I can uniquely pick any <coughs> point, like say there, Right? And I can say, alright, just measure the angle from that point to the positive, that's a pretty bad line, positive x-axis. You've got an angle there. That's the single value you need to know where you are on the ellipse. So that's really good. Now the parabola, we dealt with the parabola a while ago. This is the form that we would generally use to make the, the parameter, the parametric forms nice and neat. Right? Who remembers what our x and our y are? What you're talking about, the parabola. 2AT, AT squared. Very good. 2AT, AT squared. And it's worth remembering that we've gone from angle territory to here, where you honestly could define it by an angle, but it is more useful to us to define it as, what is the parameter we chose? The gradient, right? Because anywhere on the parabola, right, they, every point on the parabola always has a different gradient to every other point on the parabola. So therefore, gradient, so I'll just T is gradient. Gradient is a great thing to pick because it makes calculus easier and all that. Okay. Now we come to the hyperbola. Okay. So we have um, a standard form. Okay. X squared on A squared minus. Uh, and of course we could switch around the X squared and Y squared if we wanted the conjugate hyperbola. Okay. 
But I don't want to jump straight to, well, what, what is the form, okay? Um, the first thing I want to point out is that here we had angles, then we went to gradient, okay? You have a look at this. Is gradient going to be a good choice for defining where you are on the locus? And the answer is no, not really. Because of all the crazy symmetry that you've got, right? Every point has a gradient, but it also has another point that shares exactly the same gradient, right? On the opposite side of the other quadrant, okay? So gradient's going to be no good. How about angle? Would angle work? Is every point uniquely defined by angle? Now, it is not nearly as obvious uh, versus the ellipse and versus the circle. But if I, unfortunately, I didn't have a rule here. Actually, can I borrow someone's rule? The diagram is small. Okay. This one's special, and it will not involve my inability to catch. Okay. Um, if I take this and I say, all right, measure for the origin, right? And remembering that, like, this isn't going, but maybe this is a better way to do it, right? So that would be, like, say, zero, right? I could go up. I'm only ever hitting one point on the locus. Do you agree with that, right? I can spin all the way over here. I'm still hitting only one point on the locus. It's working out. Angle will be fine. It'll be better than gradient, for sure. Okay. So, how do I then use that? What, what equations? It's obviously not going to be cos and sine. So how do I arrive at this, okay? Now, rather than just hand them to you, I want you to remember how we did it for the circle, okay? In the circle, from the center, okay, what we measured was there's a point up there on the locus, and then we said, okay, well, there's a right angle triangle hiding there. Do you remember that? Uh, obviously, we didn't start with a, a circle of any radius. We started with the unit circle, right? This is your x-coordinate, and this is your y-coordinate, okay? Now, do you see out of here, how these guys emerge. Do you see it? Right? Have a look. If I define that angle that we talked about here as theta, right, in that right angle triangle, cos x, cos, sorry, cos theta is equal to x on y. X on one, one right? Or adjacent on hypotenuse. So that's where your x equals cos theta comes from. And then likewise, you get this relationship. And of course, you scale it up by r to get to this arbitrary circle. Now, that's really nice because then if you carry that forward from here, right, this of course makes sense because you have this kind of shape. Right? Well, this is quite an equation, I should say, right? And the Pythagorean identity fits that perfectly, right? Sine squared plus cos squared, I should say cos squared plus sine squared equals one. Happy? But we're now trying to deal with this. Just for the sake of simplicity, I've taken the A and B out of it because they're just proportions, right? If I can understand this, everything will be fine. 